the AI expert is a big, huge exaggeration. Three years ago, I didn't know much about AI. I came from market research and analytics, advanced analytics background, and I was looking for a technology that will help me take what's in my head, put it into a software, and automate it. And I'll tell later what, what it is. Uh, so the company is called Heartbeat AI Technologies. It's a text and emotion analytics company. An independent study just came out a few months ago and they listed us as uh, one of the top 20 emotion analytics companies in the world. And IBM tops the list and we're at the bottom of the list. But to be a third, you know, a three year old baby company and to be a, you know, along the line with IBM, it's, uh, yeah, it's quite, a, quite a fit. Hi, I'm uh, Hasif uh, Sharif. I, so I did my grad work in uh, fractals in mathematical modeling. Uh, and then uh, I moved into the AI field at the IBM. Uh, so, so in a way, we've been doing AI before it was termed AI, which is creating models and creating all that stuff. So, uh, so in IBM, we're at a client-facing role. We uh, work for the IoT slash AI practice, and this is in. The, uh, so most of our clients are in the uh, who are industries who are looking to transition to Industry 4.0 and you know, deploy those principles. So what that means is that uh, it's being called a fourth industrial revolution where it's not just uh, robotics and automation, but it's where robots, uh, where, uh, uh, where decision making is decentralized and uh, you have uh, decision making happening and you have cognitive aspects within the industry itself. So, uh, so yeah, that's, that's me. <laughs> Hi, my name is Mark Campbell. I started out um, doing 3D modeling and uh, working with different um, characteristics through 3D modeling. I then transitioned over into the automotive sector, which I thought was interesting. More on the fifth line of view, I was automatically seeing the, how things are structured, how things are programmed using automation. So pretty much the automotive industry was one of the first companies to start utilizing the artificial intelligence benefits and how to make things happen in real time. And without a repetitive basis, because they thought humans were would slack off on a Friday evening, and you, you, you'll get a car that's called a lemon on a Friday to go for the Monday or Friday. So that's what they started putting a lot of money in automotive. But out of that, I found that time a little bit, uh, just I wanted to do different things. So we're with a private company right now. We build out intelligent characteristics, insights for how we predict someone buying your product. So we build out clones, we run through a massive database and come up with different algorithms that will say, okay, why would this person buy this product? Or is this person likely to be my best customer in like two years? So that's the type of um, AI and so that's how I work. Great, awesome, thank you. Uh, <laughs> You've won them over, I think. Uh, so uh, we don't have a lot of time, so we'll, we'll, we'll skip right to the meat of the matter. Um, there's a lot of concern about artificial intelligence and, and the ethical consequences of deploying some of these systems. Um, some people say AI will destroy jobs by automating many, uh, many forms of manual labor. And others say that this will balance out by creating more creative jobs that require more uh, creative work that can be automated. How do you see the future of the job market and the worker profile for the future? Well, I, I can kick start that. I, I've been thinking a lot about it and I speak a lot and uh, try to take the anxiety out of the field of AI. And for me, uh, AI is not artificial intelligence because we're too far from that. It's a rather augmented intelligence. And what augmented intelligence does, what it did to chess playing, well, those guys did it when it was in the <laughs> 80s. They first did the best Russian chess player in chess, and then he partnered with the best of computer, and now uh, human and the machine is, is unbeatable in chess. So think about that, the human and machine. They're better than just human by itself and machine by itself. So that's augmented AI. In any field, in my field, market research and analytics field, it's the same way. Machine will take you to 80% there, and then you use your brilliant human brain to uh, bring brilliant human insights to, to your customers. So that's an um, optimistic approach. Yeah, uh, yeah. so I, I'll add on to that, right? And, uh, it's great that we also use augmented intelligence. Uh, we use the word, the terminology, 
I add on to the fact that, um, so I think there's a lot of jobs that are really a very, a series of very simple tasks. And those jobs are uh, definitely at risk of uh, being uh, disrupted. Um, and that uh, it will create lots of issues. Um, however, um, I think uh, one, one of the things uh, we can skip right ahead as to what's going to happen is that uh, uh, generally technology gets, uh, uh, gets implemented and picked up as, as much as uh, workers, uh, as much as important workers are, right? As uh, well the, uh, the uh, workers are about the technology and how good they are to use it. So if, it, if they're not, if they don't know how to use AI system, it's not really going to be uh, impacted. The second thing I want to uh, emphasize is that uh, we're going to start valuing, I think, uh, human interaction more. But as uh, commodities, uh, as you know, if you think about it, right, you, you go get a camera, right, or, uh, you know, the cameras are kind of out of fashion now, but if you do get one, it was, uh, it's, you know, you have $20 for a camera. But it's a lot of technology that's going in, and you get a webcam, so it's a lot of technology there, and you're getting it for like 20, 25, 30 dollars on eBay or something. Um, however, if you go and buy a handmade, uh, you know, t-shirt, or you go and watch a concert, you're sp spending a lot, lot more. And that's what I think are, is going to be uh, drivers of value, the human interactions. Yeah, well, absolutely. Um, just as I was mentioning earlier, another describe what I did it was uh, through automotive. That sector is, although a lot of they've scaled it down, but they've also had gotten warriors where a lot of people have more higher paying jobs because they're able to operate these machines that are run through artificial intelligence. So I mean, I don't, yes, I do think that artificial intelligence is going to take away a lot of jobs, but again, it's a lot of the repetitive jobs that something can be done without making a mistake. It doesn't rest unless you tell it after eight hours, have a break. Right? But other than that, it's going to keep doing the same thing over and over. And what happens is, but it gives a lot of leeway for, I guess, now, where people say, well, I want to learn a new skill. I want to add this up. And then they say Auto automatically, this is how you operate this type of machine. Or you move from here. But one of the things where <coughs> artificial intelligence where, where there's lacking right now is it's the manual jobs. Like construction, there's a big gap with that. I mean, there are those areas. You know, I don't see in the, in the future right now that you're going to see someone up there on the skyscrapers, you know, machine doing this. You know, you need to have that mindset to say, well, this is not going to work. And those jobs, I think, will always be there. But because everybody loves tech, everyone's jumping to tech. This you can make a lot of money. But, you know, let's be honest. You know, you can be a millionaire overnight. And um, but at the at the end of the day, is when it comes down to it, people are realizing that if I don't step up my skills. What's going to happen? I'm going to be left behind. And they always prefer you, know, you need to go to school, but now these are the reasons why you need to go. You need to learn these type of extra um, additions to your skill skill level. And with that, I don't see it being a um, a force to say to keep you down. I think it's a force to lift you up. You can get a few different skills and understand what it's about. You know, right now AI is very disruptive. If you don't pay attention, you're going to be like way behind. And even to know, learn the smaller things, I think that helps give time in the future. But it comes down to, yes, it is, is the way of the future through many different facets. Great, thank you. Uh, well, let's talk. Oh, uh, do you have a question, please? Sorry to interrupt. It's not a question. Just to add to that, I think every major breakthrough in humanity has that fear if you look back from agriculture, from the agricultural age into the industrial revolution. Same thing happened, yes. and you know now used to be ninety percent, you know, agricultural workers. Now it's five percent, yeah. but everybody has job skills, right? Yeah, you're right. Especially like when computers first came out, it was a like, oh my god, computers gonna take away all my jobs. Well, now it's <laughs> computer, right? So it's uh, it's about adapting. That's what I was saying. People adapt with this new technology, how to use it, and how to maneuver around with these type of uh, capabilities and skill sets. So. Uh, I, I, my software team is in Kyrgyzstan, Bishkek, which is actually my uh, country, uh, country where I was born and raised. It's in Central Asia. It's a third world, you know, very poor country. But uh, we, we hired, uh, we started with hiring three people full time two years, two and a half years ago, and paid them very basic salary. Now they double their skills. They all learn Python. They learn programming. And we double their salary. So think like where, what field in a third world country can a team, 
know, double, double salary and maybe, you know, quadruple their skill set. You know, it's a miracle. It's a miracle for them and we are hiring four more people by the end of this year. So next year we'll have 20 people and we'll give scholarships and maybe negotiate with uh, uh, universities around the world to give them free diplomas and online education. There's a lot of opportunity. Yeah. Um, another question. Just, just being, just being the devil's advocate here. I mean, I understand when you when you say that, and we bump up our own skills being in the in the tech world. Um, looking at it from you know millennials, being millennials, they it's said that they don't like talking. You get the work done. We don't want any human interaction at all. We're okay with Siri or Google Home or whatever that is. But when we look at AI right now, looking at you know the construction part. Of it, the jobs which will go away are are not the skills IBM or GE is going to raise or contribute anything to. So, do you think, uh, as economy, are we ready, or, or do we have the resources and the tools to bump up those skills? Because because none of the IBMs and Microsofts in the world are going to bump up those uh, low-level job skills, but we can use AI to build now. Or, or very, very, very near future. So, uh, in defense of IBM, <laughs> 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 That's what <laughs> in defense of IBM. Uh, so, I, I think uh, so. Uh, when we look at AI and we look at uh, you know replacing a human, uh, we're still some way away. Like uh, you know, um, so, so some of the things that we're good at right now, right? The soft jobs that we're, we can actually automate, right, are mostly to do with perception, right? Um, the, you know, uh, visual perception, you know, sensory perception, all that kind of stuff. You know, you think about a security guard who watches uh, people, uh, you know, all through. We can automate some, a lot of those jobs, right? So those small series of tasks that uh, happen repetitively, uh, like uh, you said. Um, in terms of uh, whether uh, those skills are, um, it, it, so uh, the other skills that are not being replaced at least in the medium term future, or at, at this point in time, are, you know, Planning, the reasoning, the, the things that humans do, the reasoning, and that's why construction is also a hard uh, uh, place to work with. The reasoning job, you know, jobs that require reasoning, jobs that require planning, those are still going to be uh, difficult to, I think, uh, uh, address at this, at the short to medium term. As well as emergency services, you don't want a robot coming over to you. Yeah. No, I think uh, again, you're saying it's, it comes down to a lot of companies right now have been sinking a lot of money four or five years ago, right? especially the automotive industry, the marketing industry, right? some of these agencies, they've been buying up areas where they've been teaching their staff how to use it. Like to figure out, like I was mentioning earlier about insights, what we do. We're able to figure out who's your best customer. When is your best customer going to be able to, say, purchase this car? Who's the best customer like to go on a vacation? So they've been using it, so it's not about putting them aside and saying, well... Because I'm saying, so it has to be a balance of effort that's right. both ends. I mean, I'm all for AI. I, right. I mean, we adopt technology like nobody's business. So, I mean, but the, on, the, on the parallel side, there, there has to be an effort to, to bump up those skills, uh, to be able to give those kind of resources out to, for people to, uh, you know, retrain themselves to do something else. Better. Well, yeah, I mean, now there is a lot of areas where companies are offering, they do offer you to upgrade your skills. I mean, and before, uh, you'd be able, a class would cost a lot, a lot of money to take something like this. Now it's scaled down because of the, the demand. So it's there. So there's adapting a shift for people to learn if they want. It's not like it's impossible. Uh, or say, okay, it's 10,000, people can't afford that. You know, it's getting to be like 500. I hear what you're saying, though. Uh, just going quickly, sir, one more thing to add. There's a lot of online learning, I think, that can help Sarah with that. And the other th th point is that um, a lot of the technology and AI that comes out is, put, is made open source. And we, in our practice, actually use a lot of open source technology. We see a lot of our clients asking for open source technologies. So there is a democratization of all the technology where people can take advantage of, uh, you know, uh, upgrading their skills and understanding all the that are happening. Awesome. Uh, uh, think about a presentation of open source 
for artificial intelligence? Do you think it's more than 50%? Um, yes, I think so. I think I would say. Uh, sorry, can you repeat the question on what did you yeah. say with open source? The think open source is uh, it's creating the artificial intelligence. Yeah. It's, it's hard to quantify these things, right? Because there is uh, the aspect of technology and the aspect of data, right? Uh, nobody has as much data as you know, get Google and Facebook, right? And you can't, uh, you can't uh, like I think if you create a, a system, if you want to create a system, you need something like 50,000 hours of uh, you know, uh, speaking, uh, people speaking, and all that, all that transcribed. Google has that. Not everybody has that. But there are, but Google open sources a lot of their stuff. IBM open sources a lot of our stuff, right? And you can go and you can subscribe to the, an account and you can use it, right? So you can still deploy it, yeah. Any more questions? Okay, well let's talk a little bit about bias. Uh, when we first started talking publicly about AI, there was held up this great hope that artificial intelligence would somehow be unbiased or prevent uh, human bias from entering into management decision-making. What we've seen is that uh, human bias is entering into machine learning models. Is it possible to have a truly bias-free artificial intelligence? And if not, how do we manage that risk? This is your question. <laughs> <laughs> That's a big question. <laughs> and uh, yeah, we, we actually um, addressed this question before we built the system. So my conscious decision was to build this system, and it's uh, all it does is pull the words and phrases of emotions and classifies it in multiple emotions. We chose, uh, well, back in my career, I hated black boxes. So when I see a black box, I don't trust it. I don't open it and see what's inside. So we build a white box, we build an open box, so you see everything that goes into every bucket, so if you, if you want to. And that's one first step to show an open system and say, okay, here, you know, I'm taking responsibility of 90%, 80% of accuracy, come in client and look at it and let's build to 95%. And you will together decide and will avoid the bias. So uh, another way we included, uh, um, well, not completely avoiding the bias, but uh, included it as much as possible is we uh, train this baby. We human, you know, we we hired professional human psychologists and coded every word and every phrase. So we will be like between four and five people coded and agreed on the coding of the words. So we didn't just dump a lot of data in it and run uh, machine uh, unsupervised learning algorithms because that's what happens when you put the data and machine learning unsupervised algorithms run on it. They will inherit the bias of the data. So if your data is biased, that's what happens. So a computer doesn't doesn't have a bias, we have a bias. And our Twitter data has a bias, and you know what happened with Microsoft put out a Twitter chatbot in 24 hours, it was beyond bias, right? So, uh, and it's, I think, uh, to me, because I'm a founder of this company, and it's my personal responsibility to clean and to open uh, uh, the, the box and to show, and, and to be responsible for what we, for what we do. We know cases of uh, Facebook and Cambridge Analytica. And we're all aware of that, so I want to prevent any situation like that before we. I want to add uh, just two pieces to it. I think a lot of this uh, idea that AI is a black box comes from the uh, uh, when you use uh, deep learning models, you, know, you have multiple uh, layers of neurons and all that kind of stuff. Um, I, I think there's two things there to add. One is that it's not really a black box. We know what's happening in there. We know all the parameters that are in there. We know all the weights that are in there, we can uh, do sensitivity analysis and all that kind of stuff. Um, uh, uh, but but uh, it, uh, I think Jan Lekun would say it's just not as uh, useful, and that's why we don't do it. Um, second thing I want to add is that uh, people have inherent biases, and it's much harder to remove biases from people. Uh, I think, uh, you know, she's explained it really uh, what uh, we can do with uh, models. That is, we, once we know that there is a bias, we can uh, work to address it. And I think that's what uh, you're doing quite well. Yeah. And we know how to do it. And we know how, know how to do it. To do exactly. It. So it's just yeah. a matter of actually putting money into doing it and being accountable. Yeah. yeah. I'll shift a little bit over from that. No, at the end of the day, I mean, if there is a method and structure on how to set up the whole format from start to end, yes, you can remove some of the biases, as you mentioned. 
But what has happened at certain times is a lot of the, um, the AI, the artificial intelligence, it takes some of the characteristics of the developers when it's being programmed. I'll even tell you that for, uh, there's a company out of Florida, and it was based on a criminal system. Uh, so they were profiled. They profiled all the people, and they took shots from every angle, race, um, gender, and they say, how likely will this person be able to commit a crime in a few years? So they had Hispanic, uh, African-American, Caucasian. The African girl scored 8 out of 10 likely to commit a crime in two years. Uh, the Hispanic, a little lower, and the Caucasian, 3 points out of 10. Well, they did a survey on it, they checked it out. So this was through the criminal system. And guess what? The Caucasian person, male, committed a crime in two years. Everyone else did not. So there was a bias in the programming by the first, by the developers to say, well, these people look like this. Well, automatically they're going to be just going to commit a crime. So there is a bias to it. So that's what I'm saying. To, to, to remove the bias in terms of, say, you have to come for the mythology and the proper structure to say, remove, let's remove all the areas and the negative sections where this can create an issue. See, if it's manufacturing, it's a little more easier. But now you're talking interaction and movement, it becomes a lot less to, uh, likely that you're going to be clean on it. You have to understand and say, okay, break down the structures, remove them out, and that's why it's a lot, it's a lot more, it's, a, it's very difficult. So there, at the time right now, I believe there is a bias. It, from moving maybe further on, when people have really broken down and developed the methodology and structure of it, then they can start saying, okay, yes, we can move along successfully without saying this young lady is going to commit a crime or this person or that person is going to do this, right? So. Well, a long-term solution, uh, think of accounting, right? There's a taxation, for example, there's audit system, yeah. there's rules there. There's right. regulations and all. So AI is not regulated today, but well, sooner rather than later, it should be regulated with audit and with with all rules. It's just it's just a matter of time, and I think it's going to go fast. Uh, in the criminal system, or if it's going to say you know uh, categorize different people, then it's it's a it's a hundred percent we need to control control. But as an investor into businesses, for example, accounting you mentioned. I want the bias because I want that uh, artificial intelligence to be created. Uh, accounting is not always ones and twos and threes. It's about being creative to lower taxes instead of this and that. I want that. I want the bias in there, uh, and that's the that's the business that I'm going to invest into. So we have to make a very clear distinction on where we apply that uh, that artificial or augmented intelligence. Yes, that bias on certain areas can can be beneficial. Like we do data and we do the modeling of the best characteristics. So we don't want someone for them, if we're advertising to say someone's going to be uh, spending $2,000 coming to the store, likely in the U.S. they go by decile, zero to nine. Zero being wonderful, nine being not, so not good. So you're going to model your, your database and your best customer acquisition to look like your zeros and ones to achieve the best result. And that's where the bias comes in, is it's going to go through all these different uh, 300 million uh, people in a database to break it down to see which actually fits the model. So that's where you want the bias. I mean, you, want, you wouldn't want the bias in terms of someone's life or, right, exactly, or someone's day-to-day um, -day activities. If you're talking about spending, for someone to bring in a customer, yes, you want the best fits because you're spending that money. You're spending your, your dollars to say, I'm going to advertise to this person. You don't want to advertise and throw, like they say, bombard an area, throw flyers, and people say, oh, it's interesting. You want to target that specific person. So that's where the bias would come in to say, I'm going to target you, sir, because I know that you spend this amount of money, you like to shop here, this and that. I'm not going to target you because, I'm not going to target me because I'm not going to spend the $2,000 or whatever it is. Yeah. So that's the difference is they need to know. So that's where the bias comes from. Well, I have a follow-up question. So, uh, most of us in this room know about GDPR, which uh, went into effect last week. And it's been suggested to me that um, there is a right to an explanation for automated decision-making method of the GDPR. Compliance issues aside, GDPR aside, I, I, I've heard it's a non-trivial problem to actually extract an explanation 
from some of the extra these extraordinarily complex systems, it, is there a way to balance utility and a right to an explanation if we as a society decide we require an explanation for how decisions are made? Well, uh, it might be a harder problem for established companies, because they need to build the engine hmm. now, post factum. If you're building it from scratch, you can build it in from scratch. Sure. And uh, there's uh, so many tools, I mean, including, I'm not, I'm not a blockchain expert, but I think that's one way. And I think the, uh, what, what I heard is the Estonian government is actually using blockchain to uh, distribute the information, and that's where you can track it. So this would be a beautiful example of how it could be done. I, I don't know how I used it. So I think uh, uh, so. I think the question there is hard. hard the, uh, so the question is, uh, you know, giving explanations. So when we talk about AI models and uh, and things like that, when especially when we go to clients, um, one of the things that we do face is that uh, we have to explain our models to clients, right? And what that means is that sometimes you um, you give up a little bit of, or sometimes a little bit more of uh, how good your model is uh, to uh, to take a uh, an algorithm that is much easier to explain right? and you and you use that in a look for example um, in this uh, kind of a scenario right uh, perhaps uh, you do want to be able to explain it right and you might just you know start using regression uh, to, uh, to uh, you know and then uh, simple models to uh, decide how to uh, you know uh, classify people or not classify people right so Depending on the circumstance, and if an explanation is uh, required, you might want to use uh, some algorithms. It sounds like, like almost a trust issue, but like yeah. we need to trust it, not just use it. It is a trust issue. I mean, you want to make sure that, um, because right now there is no trust in terms of those particular companies you just mentioned. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're the cause of this whole entire thing, what happened uh, Facebook and the league. So, I mean, when it comes down to uh, Again, they're going to have to do a lot of methodology, methodology and restructuring of how these things are programmed and how it captures people's data. And from there, then, you know, you're going to have to be upfront and honest and let people see, you know, open up the hood, let's see what's under the hood. You know, because right from now, I mean, I don't, you know, I don't trust them. I mean, because but the thing is, because they have all this data. I mean, they had that, you know, we knew this was coming. We knew this was coming at least two years from now, years ago, that they were talking about this. Because people, who they started having all this data just coming from every angle. People say, well, how do you know that about me? Well, because you shop here. And then you're on Facebook for four hours. So what do you expect? We know what you're doing. And it's just like, uh, you know, when you know Twitter said to Google, well, how come you're not, you're not interested in buying us? Google, why would you buy it? We know everything about you. They use our browser to log on. So why would you? So it comes down to that. <laughs> <laughs> it's great. So that's where all the information. But, but it's both ways, right? You can do that stuff because you have data, mm -hmm. and you just need you just need a policeman there, basically. I mean, even you would need that kind of data to know when this customer is going to buy your right. product again. That's right. what it is to your client. Right, but there's also, and we use that type of information. There are structures that we don't go beyond. There are parameters we don't go beyond. But again, you right. still you right. still need that audit, right? I mean, if Facebook it didn't uh, leak out, nobody would know that they were doing something wrong. No, but they will always. There's always someone watching. Like there's that's how they knew. So there's all just if you say, oh, where's no, they knew that they were doing this. There's always like this when Microsoft was getting too large and people got jealous. Say, oh, we got to break it down. So they broke down Microsoft. Well, they're, they've been watching Microsoft for years before they split, split it up. It's just like they've been watching Facebook for a long time. You know? Hopefully they're not watching us or crazy things. <laughs> 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 but, um, you know, it comes down to, um, you know, trust and trust, structure. You have to restructure. I'm sure that well, I just want to go back to your bit about the uh, data that we uh, yeah. Because in my point of view, it's like everything is new in the yeah. okay. area. We have some functionality and some functions that can be built into that. But I'm pretty sure that this can be disrupted again. And it will be like that. So if we put it in, like, in a black box and we say 
hey, developers around the world are not using it like that. I think it's the biggest mistake we can make in this industry. What do you think about it? Uh, so, I think I'm, I, uh, what I'm trying to say is that it's not really a black box. Right. Um, uh, whenever uh, for certain, certain, you know, certain companies will make uh, their products black box in the sense that they don't give you what's happening, uh, what's uh, what they're doing in the background, right? Underneath the voices and you say, right? Um, but in terms of um, uh, in terms of the, uh, the mathematics and the technology behind it, right? Uh, we know what uh, what's uh, what's there, and as and we and as uh, models improve, as we just, as we find, uh, you know. Uh, in different kinds of uh, neural networks to, uh, you know, better uh, approximate uh, our systems or better do things. Um, we, we, I think that we should continue to, uh, to make it open source so that uh, people um, uh, can examine it and uh, understand it and deploy it, of course. Okay, thank you. Uh, one more question back here. So my, my name is Daniel Mandias. Um, so my question to you is, uh, about a month ago, I heard a speech from Salim Ishmael, Ismail, the Excel Foundation. He's black. So he used to run Gatlin's incubator program. The example he gave of um, AI and you know, possible multiplier effect was uh, so autonomous driving. So he, he but he, he drove from Toronto to Miami um, by last December and he was on 60% autopilot and Miami to Toronto in March it was 80% autopilot. So eventually, because of the data he gathered for Tesla, so eventually he said it would go to 100%. And the, the multiplier effect would be that if once autonomous drone to drive was generally accepted, that the road capacities would be 10 to 15 x times greater. And then that would have profound effects on just like real estate values that nobody would be put in the city anymore. Proximity is no longer as relevant. Where do you see? So that's one big example we gave. Where do you see the examples in what you guys do in terms of having major multiplier effect on society? Like we tried that Google Home device and then people played with it for a few days and then lost interest. Like I, I don't see Google Home as being major. Well, I love missing something. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I'm going to put my my bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's kind of the experience that we, we, we have. <laughs> well, uh, just the first idea come to mind. Uh, last week I started researching affordable housing, building affordable housing, and there's a 3D printing, and a few houses around the world have been printed, actually, and within 24 hours to maybe four days, the base of the house. And that's a 3D printing, there's AI, could be AI element to it, with the architecture, the complexity of it, and uh, so that's the, uh, you know, once this is done, and the house instead, the base of the house is printed in 24 hours for $10,000 instead of, you know, four months and $100,000, that's affordable housing. That's a multiplier effect where we, you know, people in the developed world and the developing world could afford good quality housing that could change lives. It's safety, it's, you know, the, uh, post-earthquake uh, and post-natural post, uh, you know, natural disaster with feedback. So we could build life better, faster, and cheaper for the whole world, not just for the Western world. That's how I see it, and that's my big goal, actually. Because I came from a third world country. Canada is a wonderful, safe, beautiful country, but I'm going back to my mind thinking, people in my country, they need that. They need affordable housing, they need the jobs. They might need uh, autonomous cars and so on. So that technology will take them to 21st century. Okay. Well, I, I'm being given the signal to, to wrap up. Do we have any last question before we, we end with this, this fascinating discussion? Well, great. Please give a warm thank you. For